Welcome everyone to the Q&A session for our upcoming course, The Five Ancestral Realms, the seven week journey to activate new sources of ancestral wisdom to transform your life and lineage. I'm Lisa Bonice, and it's my honor to be hosting this Q&A conversation for the Shift Network, where we'll explore the teachings of Dr. Stephen Farmer and address your questions about his upcoming seven-week course, The Five Ancestral Realms, which begins Tuesday, October 29th. And a little later, I'll explain how you can participate in the course, even if you can't attend the live sessions. But first, I want to introduce our guest. Dr. Stephen Farmer is a psychotherapist, shamanic healer, and the author of several best-selling books and oracle cards, including Animal Spirit Guides, Earth Magic, and the recently released Shaman's Path Cards and Spirit Animals as Teachers, Guides, and Healers. He offers core healing sessions in person or remotely and serves on the board of the Society for Shamanic Practice. And in addition to being a licensed psychotherapist, Dr. Farmer is also an ordained minister in the Circle of Sacred Earth Church. And in just a few minutes, we're going to open up for your questions for, for, from our audience. But first, I want to bring Stephen online. Welcome, Stephen. It's so great to be with you this evening. Oh, thank you, Lisa. I look forward to it. Been looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Uh, when uh, I hosted the Ancestral Healing Summit last year, you were one of our guests, and uh, I, I truly enjoyed our talk. Uh, so now you're teaching a course with Shift. So uh, why don't you, why don't we start out with you telling us just a little bit about the course? Well, sure. The course itself, uh, there's been a a few years of progression of my understanding and and uh, work with the ancestors. Uh, as a shamanic practitioner, which I uh, came about, initiated in that about 25 years ago, gradually, I, at that time, I didn't really think, oh, you know, much about ancestors. You know, I knew they existed, but mostly we would talk about deceased loved ones, our biological ancestors. But as I, as I went into greater, greater depth with this, I realized over the course of the years that it, really our ancestry goes way, way back. Not only that, but that we can access uh, the depth of our ancestry for uh, healing, for guidance, etc. And so I've developed, or I should say, I was, uh, it was more of downloaded, uh, that there are really five distinct types of ancestors, <clears throat> starting with the biological, which most people think that's, that's ancestors, true, and rightfully so, those are our ancestors, the lineage that we have. But I, I realized, too, from other cultures, indigenous and otherwise, how beyond the biological ancestors, there are others to which we're very deeply connected. For instance, what I've called prehistoric ancestors, animals, plants. An example of that would be the old Hawaiian spirituality. The, uh, they considered that the taro plant is the original ancestor. How's that? And also in other cultures, how the the spirit animals really are not just uh, spirit animals, but they're ancestral spirit animals. So that would be a second category, prehistoric ancestors. And then there's the archetypal ancestors. And these are specific ones, humans, that are uh, either in our lineage or even beyond that as elders that have a specific gift or talent. An example would be as a writer, I have an ancestor, an elder actually, that helps me with my writing. Uh, I talked to a friend of mine who is a psychotherapist, and she told me, just offhandedly, she told me she works with Carl Jung, who's a very famous uh, psychologist. And then beyond that, we have uh, primordial ancestors, and those are what you might think of as elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And if you think about that, and it's not that much of a stretch, you think about it, those elements are all in us, just like the animals are in us, the plants are in us. They, they really are part of our makeup. And then ultimately, what I call the master ancestor, and that's our DNA. And I go, uh, in the course, I'm gonna describe in greater, greater detail about these five different types, but uh, more, more importantly is, okay, what's the point of this? And how can we access these different levels, if you will, or these different uh, types of ancestors uh, not only um, to help us, but also to help our planet. You know, the planet is going through a lot of massive changes, 
And I really know that more and more people are hearing the call of the ancestors. My, my aim with our course is to teach people how they can heed that call and also uh, help the biological ancestors along their spiritual evolution in the afterlife. So that's a bit of a summary of what the course is all about. And uh, I'm really excited about it. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sort of amazed, to tell you the truth, that I have been called to do this kind of work. And yet at the same time, it makes absolutely, it just makes absolute sense that as a, an extension and an outgrowth of the work as a shamanic healer, that the ancestors have to be included. We're, we're a culture, the Western culture in general, we haven't really given a lot of consideration about ancestors, biological or otherwise. So I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm out to change that, Lisa. So uh, that's a summary, at least, of the, um, the course itself. Okay, well, I personally, I can't wait. You know that. I've already said so enough times. I can't wait for this course to start. Now, um, you've already sort of touched, well, hang on a minute. Let me give the URL because we do have the rest of our time together. I'm, I'm jumping the gun here. Uh, we have the rest of our time together to dive into our viewers' questions for Dr. Stephen Farmer. Uh, once again, the name of the course is The Five Ancestral Realms. And again, it begins Tuesday, October 29th. If you want to check out the website and learn more about the seven-week course, you can visit ancestralrealmscourse.com. And that's where you'll see the full description. You can sort of follow along with us and you can even register. So uh, we can go ahead and get started with questions or did you want to maybe lead us in a, in a welcoming chant? Um, yeah, yeah, we spoke about this just prior to the show, and uh, it's something I do. I also, um, another book that I uh, released a couple of years ago is called Healing Ancestral Karma. And again, that's part of this whole path that I've been on to uh, encourage people to incorporate ancestors. And uh, when I've taught that class, Healing Ancestral Karma, typically we start the class with a chant. And the chant really is a calling song to the ancestors. And uh, if you'd like to, those of you who are listening in, if you'd like to chant with me, it's very, very simple. And it's ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. And we repeat that, uh, one, two, three, we'll repeat that three times. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling, come, come, come. And then we'll repeat it three times. So it's like this, this is what it sounds like. And I, at the same time, that's what I'm doing is I'm calling in the ancestors even though I got to tell you, they're already here, but let's call them in and invite them in to play with us here uh, during this uh, uh, Q&A session. So I invite you to close your eyes and I'll sing it once. And then I invite you to join me for two more cycles of the calling song. Called it a chant, that's legit, but it really is a calling song. <clears throat> Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Come, come, come. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Come, come, come. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Come, come, come. And I must tell you, with my eyes closed, in my mind's eye, I can actually see uh, the ancestors, and both the more immediate ones, and especially the elders, the elders being the ones that have tra tra traversed, if that's the right word, traversed the afterlife and um, come back to help us out. And they really want to help us out during these um, changing times. So I trust uh, that you had some experience, if not seeing them, sensing their presence as we did this calling song. And please feel free to use that as part of your spiritual practice. All right. Well, thank you. I can certainly feel them. There's no doubt about that. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with some questions. I started uh, to started out a minute ago where you, you sort of touched on this, but th there's an exact question that wants to know what led you to discover this system of healing. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your first experiences with this. 
Sure. Um, I was introduced to shamanism, as I mentioned, about 20, uh, 25 or so years ago. And I, I took off. I had a very active practice as a therapist at the time, psychotherapist. And uh, I, I just took this two-day course by the Foundation of Shamanic Studies. Michael Harner was teaching it. And it just grabbed a hold of me. And so I continued to pers pursue various trainings, etc. But again, ancestors were just sort of peripheral. Uh, and at the same time, over the course of the years, I had the opportunity to visit other cultures to understand some of the other cultures that I visited, like the Hawaiian, the Australian Aboriginal, uh, uh, trip to Vietnam, Thailand, where ancestor, um, it's, not, um, it's not worship, but it's acknowledging the ancestors as a daily presence. And again, though that was again somewhat peripheral, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, peripheral in the sense that it wasn't real central to my uh, shamanic practice. However, <clears throat> what really kicked me off was once I visited a few years back, my hometown of Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, I'm a Midwesterner like you uh, at, at the base here, Lisa, and um, I was walking on the grounds and I heard this voice very loud in my head. I call it the voice or the voice of the teacher. And what was being said was, what the voice said, you're walking on the bones of your ancestors. Now, I got to say, I was much louder than that in my mind, in my head. And it really caught me. It sort of shocked me. And I, I stood there. And having, again, just been sort of acquainted with other cultures, such as Aboriginal Australians, uh, the old Hawaiian religion is, yes, the ancestors are in the land. And that's just such a concept that is beyond our normal Western uh, way of thinking about ancestors. Anyway, the, the voice, the teacher went on and on about teaching me about how the ancestors, my ancestors are in the land, you know, and the final capper was saying, can you imagine if you had lived on this land for 100,000 years, what that would be like? Uh, it just blew me away. I couldn't quite grasp it. But it really kicked me into um, knowing that the ancestors, not just my biological ancestors, but uh, the depth of the ancestors that we have as human beings on this fair planet and we're calling to me to, um, <clears throat> excuse me again, to bring this into the world more and more and to teach about it. And that led one thing to another. And it was through a series of um, shamanic journeys and downloads, I call them, because I'll sit in front of my computer uh, most mornings, I would say 90% of the time, and just say, what do you have to show me? And the ancestors show up. And then I type away at the, and what came up was uh, first thing is uh, an invitation uh, from the ancestors to do a set of oracle cards, which I'm working on now, messages of, from your ancestors. And out of that grew this typology of operating with the ancestors. And then the Shift Network contacted me and it was perfect. It was like really shortly after that, there's a greater force working this. You know, they, they say in the South, they don't ask how you doing, they say, hey, what's working you? And I tell you, this was working me, you know, I'm just feeling like blessed that the ancestors had invited me to teach more and more about this and to really see the depth of our connection, that it does go back, literally goes back millions of years when we talk about the primordial elements that this earth is constructed of. And also we hear stories and legends about coming from the stars well, DNA, again, that's another story I won't go into right now, but DNA did come from the stars. How's that one? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, that you're, you'll be getting into that in the course, so I can't wait to hear more about that. Um, and I absolutely agree that it really is uh, sort of a zeitgeist thing where uh, ancestral healing is becoming uh, really widespread, so this really is excellent timing for us to be uh, delving into this work. Um, here's a question from Brittany. She wants to know, what's the biggest benefit that you found in your practice from connecting to various ancestors? Well, there's two things. One is that I, I feel, I know when I do uh, an invocation, let's say I'm doing a healing 
uh, shamanic healing with somebody, I will go hold uh, their arm just to make some contact, and I will um, do an invocation to my ancestors. There's one ancestor in particular that I met about 23 years ago, shortly after my initial experience with shamanism, and then I learned subsequent to that, a few years later, that he has been with me my whole life. Now, this is an elder, and what he told me, or what was conveyed to me, is that he was on this earth 25,000 years ago. How's that? Now, I, I don't know, there's no way to prove it. You know, it's not science in the usual sense. When we deal with these kind of things, it's really about the soul's reality, which is just as legitimate as science. Science has its place. So does um, soul's reality. It's told, it speaks to the soul, you know, more than just to the analytical mind. Anyway, so um, that's one ancestor that came to me uh, um, a few years back and then learned subsequent to that that he's been with me my whole life. Um, the um, advantage, I think, has been that we are at a stage in our development, in our spiritual development, particularly as human beings, that um, we can use all the help that we can get. And I must say, these ancestors that are showing up, uh, they really want to help us. You know, they want to help us. They want, um, we, we, they want us to forgive them, too, for their part in this trail that's come down the pike over the last thousands of years as humans have developed into, uh, dare I say, civilized human beings, and also want to help us reverse the course of our relationship with the planet. I've said again and again, it's not about saving the planet. You know, what it is, it's about revising our relationship. In fact, Earth Mother told me that. Earth Mother, on a walk one time with my puppy dog, who is in the room here, uh, said to me, and I apologized to her, I said on our behalf as human beings, I just said to her, Mother, I am so sorry for what we've done to the earth. I feel heavy in my heart over what has happened. And uh, Earth Mother, I could hear again this voice in my head. I get a lot of my um, communications from spirit through my uh, auditory channels. And Earth Mother said to me, Oh, honey, don't worry about me. I'm doing just fine. I've been around for four and a half billion years. I'm going to be around another four billion years at least. It's you guys have to get your act together. <laughs> I guess she had a little slight southern accent. And I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not sure why. But anyway, the point being is that's it. she's an ancestor too. Mother Earth is an ancestor, obviously, because there's so much of Earth in us when you think about it, definitely. We talk about people being fiery or, or more earthy, uh, that sort of thing, or watery, more fluid, or kind of airy, you know, that those elements are within us. So um, I found it really valuable in a lot of ways, and I think, Lisa, you made the comment, too, that we're hearing more and more about the ancestors. I know Christina Pratt, who works with ancestors a lot, did something for the Shift Network. Uh, we did the Ancestor Summit. Um, uh, here I am doing a program, the course, and uh, another summit coming up. So um, it's in our consciousness, our collective consciousness, those of us who are uh, following this kind of large path that we, I don't know what to call it, but uh, an awakening path. Let's call it that. I think that's a good term for it. So, um, and plus, oh, there's so, much, uh, so many more benefits of working with the ancestors like your biological ancestors, being able to connect with them, uh, uh, seeking healing from them, as well as giving them healing so they can continue on. Forgiveness of our more immediate ancestors, wow. You know, to develop a, a compassion, you know, for those, those, those woundings that we experienced, perhaps growing up, by contacting our ancestors, our biological and lineage ancestors directly. So there's, there's a wealth of possibilities for guidance and for healing. So I, I think you'll uh, enjoy the course. I know you will. 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's change the subject just a little bit because we're getting so many questions. It's there, There's a bunch of different people asking the same questions. So uh, it's about power animals. Uh, there's one woman who, who lives in the Bronx and a, a red ta- uh, red-tailed hawk landed on her terrace and allowed her to take photos of it. There's another woman here who says that she's only lived in her new home for two months and four blackbirds have flown into her house during that time. Other people are having bobcats showing up on their porch. Uh, Basically, animal presences are showing up in their life. And the common question seems to be, how do I know which animals are appearing to just give me a message and which animals might actually be spirit animals? It's an excellent question. And it's certainly something that I've written quite a bit about. And I've now uh, seen how that fits very um, congruently with what we're talking about here is ancestors. Uh, first, a general guideline about what I would call animal spirit guides. And that is any animal that shows up to you in an unusual way and or repeatedly in a short space of time, that's an animal spirit guide. Spirit is, is communicating to you, or another way to say it is consciousness, this large field of consciousness, which we could call spirit, is trying to reach you with a message through this particular animal. That's a that's a, an overview of, of spirit animals or animal spirit guides. And then we come to these very interesting, um, uh, how would I say it, these very interesting uh, animal spirit guides that show up. And those are the ones, as I mentioned, um, in indigenous cultures, a lot of them, and the one I'm most familiar with is the Aboriginal, in Australia, um, those animals that show up in a very close way to you in an unusual way can be ancestral spirit animals. And what I've heard again and again, so many stories about uh, when my grandmother died, and I'm not, this isn't my story, but when my grandmother died, for instance, it was interesting, two days later, this dove landed on the table where I was sitting outside at a restaurant and just started singing to me. And I knew in my heart of hearts, this was grandma. And I'm sure those of you who are listening that some of you have had this kind of experience that just you go, well, it's kind of weird, you know, this crow shows up or this uh, red tailed hawk shows up and it's not too long after someone, uh, a beloved one died. Now you can take that, you can look at it two ways. One, it's actually that one, it's actually grandma. Or you could say it's a courier from grandma, depending upon what you want to think about that or how you want to consider it. I think it's, uh, for our cultural uh, perspective, I think it's a courier or a messenger that's coming to you. And it is coming from your ancestor, particularly someone who has died recently. Okay, that's one way to think about spirit animals. Another is that these animals will come to guide us, as I said, unusual and or repeatedly. And what I see now is, yes, they're not only spirit animals, animal spirit guides, but they're ancestral spirit guides, meaning they are connected to us in a way that uh, maybe goes back um, generations, generations, generations. In other words, that Um, It's not, let's say, that dove, or let me use a different example, it's not, that say, that red-tailed hawk, that way of looking at that red-tailed hawk is three different ways. One, the physical being. Two, there is a life force, a spirit that animates this physical being. Three, and this is where it gets interesting, is it's an ancestral spirit animal that's come to convey a certain message from the ancestors to give to me. And again, the ancestors are connected to the great spirit and they're they're connected to you. And so they're sending you this messenger, which often the hawk is, uh, any kind of hawk really, but red-tailed hawk we use as an example, is a messenger. And the message could be any number of things. Um, Here's how you decipher the message when you get a visitation from an animal spirit guide, an ancestral spirit animal. One, what are the characteristics of the animal? This is for the analytics. (laughs) 
uh, think about the characteristics or look up the characteristics and draw from them as a metaphor what the message might be. Example, and, uh, hawks, generally hawks, they fly very high, maybe not as high as eagle, but they fly very high. They have a broad sweeping uh, ability to have a broad sweeping vision of the land. They may be looking for lunch. And then when something attracts their attention, they collapse that vision into a very focused way. And they dive right in. Do you hear the possible messages in that, in the metaphors that you can draw from the physical characteristics? So that's one way. One way that I like is um, you can also go to um, the Internet, you know, and say um, red tail hawk, um, spirit animal, totem animal, and see what comes up there. There's a lot of sites that will give you some possibilities for what that means. Now, I got to tell you, though, uh, the more you work with this, when you identify a, an animal that shows up, and by the way, I must also add that it's not just the physical animal. But it's also, you could see the symbol of the animal. It could be on a billboard. Uh, you could have a dream about an animal. So those are just as legitimate. That's another way that these ancestral spirit animals try to reach you. Anyway, the, another way, and I, this is the one I really encourage people to do, is ask the spirit animal what the message is. What I mean by that, and let's go back, uh, stay with, I should say, the red-tailed hawk. And uh, the listener who asked about the red-tailed hawk, this would be a great exercise for you. Close your eyes, and what you do then is you, you communicate telepathically. You're not just talking to that hawk, the physical animal, or the spirit of that physical animal, the life force. When you're addressing it this way, you're talking to that hawk as, um, I call them sometimes sales reps. You know, they're coming forward to to pass along a message, you know, to try to sell you, not sell you on a uh, hard sell, but sell you on this message. And so um, what you do is you say, you're speaking, I'm trying to say two things at once. You're speaking to the, um, you could say the collective consciousness of all red-tailed hawks. Or the oversoul is another way to say it. Represented by this specific physical being that's shown up or the symbolic being that showed up in a dream. What you do is you close your eyes, you bring in, if you can see a, a visual on the inside of your eyelids, you just say, hawk, not a hawk, not the hawk, hawk. By leaving out an and the, you're, you're addressing that oversoul or the collective consciousness of that particular being. Hawk, what's your message? And then you wait. And what you then do is notice whatever you perceive, what you see on the inside of your eyes, uh, your mind's eye, uh, your eyes open, they're drawn to something, what you see, what you hear, it could be something outside of you or something inside, again, the voice like I referred to. Uh, and often spirit speaks to us when they do come through the auditory channel in very short, they don't go into a whole six paragraph uh, diatribe, usually it's very short. Um, the third way is, uh, I call it kinesthetic. And what that implies is the body, the sensations in the body. I get a feeling, I get prickles, something, I get a feeling that I've gotta go, uh, go visit Aunt Mary or something like that. I just get a feeling, I can't really um, pinpoint why. Uh, that's three, okay, so visual, auditory, kinesthetic. And then there's a fourth way It's kind of interesting. It's close to intuition, and that's cognitive. And what that means is sometimes when people ask, let's say red Tail hawk, what's your message, that what comes through is just you know what it means. Or when you first spot that ancestral spirit animal, you know what it means. So there's, you know, there's quite a bit more to that, especially in working with ancestors. You can um, uh, shapeshift into, let's say, eagle, and go visit one of the elders. Uh, there's um, messages that can be conveyed through that particular spirit animal by asking. And the other thing, I just uh, to complete that, is what I mentioned about visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and cognitive. Um, most of us are, are like really good at one or two of those, and the others are maybe a little underdeveloped for no reason at all. 
for me, for instance, auditory is a big, strong one, as well as kinesthetic. I, I'm really tuned into my body and the sensations in the body when something like this happens. And that gives me information. And then I translate it. And the other is, like I've said, very, very strongly is auditory. And some people are more visual. And that's legitimate, too. But um, you want to you want to go with the best, you know. You want to go with the one that you you really rely on, uh, both in perceiving the world in ordinary reality as well as the perception of non ordinary reality. And again, we're going to go into this more during the course, but that gives you a, it's a pretty good sweep of what spirit animals are about. Yeah, I think that was a really, uh, really good coverage of the topic. Thank you for that, because like I said, there were a lot of people asking about it, and I think that was a really thorough response. Uh, and for those of you who are just joining us, we're here with Dr. Stephen Farmer, learning about his upcoming course, The Five Ancestral Realms, which begins Tuesday, October 29th. And you can log on to ancestralrealmscourse.com for all the details and to register. So let's get back to questions. Boy, do we have a lot of them. Uh, we got a question here from Kathy who wants to know. She says, I often dream of deceased relatives. Is this a visit or just a dream? It is a visit. Count on it. <laughs> now, having said that, and I, you notice I said it very quickly, I think that, you know, there's, there's a tendency to be skeptical. Like, you know, what is that? Is that just a you know, memory maybe popping in? But that's one way that our um, closer deceased loved ones, ancestors, uh, try to reach us through our dreams. And again, I've heard story after story after story like that, Kathy. So I want you to trust that. Now, let me stretch you a little bit on this one, too. You can try to reach them. And the way you do that, let's say if it's an aunt or an uncle, I don't know why I say aunt. Now, I always go aunt, <laughs> my aunt. But an aunt or an uncle or a grandmother or parent doesn't matter who, but what you can do is uh, try and reach them. There's a couple ways you can do it. And again, closing your eyes, calling and saying, I'd like to get a message from you. I'd like to get some um, evidence, you know, that you're here, that you're with me. Because they do visit, they do come to us. And that's one channel, partly because we're, we're much more open during the dream time. You know, we're in a very deep state of receptivity during a dream. So it's almost like they go, okay, she's going to sleep now. Tell you what, I'm going to go jump into her dream right now, even if I look like I'm driving a truck, which I've never driven before, it's going to be me in that truck. <laughs> and so they wake up and go, wow, that was my grandma? And yes, it was. Um, the other thing, uh, some of you probably have heard of this, is automatic writing. Uh, and it's a very... Um, effective way to communicate plus you can get a dialogue going and what you do is you go into use your breath to sort of relax put your pen in your hand and again I'm going to just use an example Aunt Mary you know dear Aunt Mary who I was close to and I would write dear Aunt Mary and I would write a letter to her and then I'd skip a beat and I say Aunt Mary if you have something to say please say it through this writing and it's the weirdest thing because it feels like your hand is writing, but you're not, it's not connected to you. Those of you who've tried it, you know what I mean. It's, it, it's the strangest thing and it's very, very effective. And you just watch as your hand does what it needs to do. You, you, even the way I'm putting in language, it, it says, you know, it's not really part of me. Well, it's Aunt Mary that's coming through. You've asked her, you've invited her to communicate to you in this way. Um, and the other way is, like I say, with spirit animals, uh, let's say take a, a dove or dove spirit represented by that dove, um, is you ask dove spirit, uh, dove, can you contact Aunt Mary? And then if there's a message for me, the next time you appear, let me know what that message is from Aunt Mary. Again, experiment with these kind of things. I always invite people, be skeptical, okay, but put your beliefs and disbeliefs aside and give it a go. You know, find find out just from your own experience. And that's something that um, in shamanism is, is very critical, although it doesn't have to be shamanic, uh, to uh, practice this principle, which is the principle of direct revelation. In other words, we get our information directly from spirit guides, including ancestors. 
And that's what we're, we're moving to more and more. And it's something, by the way, that our long ago ancestors knew. I have a dear friend that uh, lives in Colorado, um, 80 acre buffalo ranch, which she and her husband uh, run. And uh, she's Cherokee medicine woman. Uh, Eva is her name. Eva has this remarkable um, practice, uh, ritual, sacred ritual, where she goes out early in the morning, no matter the weather. You know, she might go in the barn if it's raining heavily or snowing heavily, but other than that, she's outside. She walk outside. She start. She just listens, and the various spirit guides and the spirits of the land, which we could say are the ancestors, will speak to her. They'll communicate to her. And again, in her uh, culture that she was raised in, everything is relationship. You know, there, there, there's grandfather wind, grandmother ocean, the cloud people, the tree people, or the standing ones. And this, what you'll do then is receive messages for whoever shows up from these various ancestral spirit guides. And then she'll go and she'll transcribe those messages and then send them out to her uh, mailing list. Uh, I, I just so admire her in so many different ways, but especially that dedication to receiving those messages that are really, really quite helpful. And um, I, again, I want to stress, you too can do this. You know, it's not that difficult. You just got to learn how to listen as best you can. And I'm saying that in a general way, listen with your eyes, your ears, your senses, and certainly your mind that uh, where those that knowing just jumps in at you. And especially when we work with ancestors, no matter which of the five or all five of them that you work with, that you can receive messages and guidance. And you all know, if you're listening, um, if you're listening to this, you all know how critically important that is. And my pitch to you is yes, and start thinking, working with, experimenting, and experiencing the wonderful love that the ancestors have for their, uh, shall we say, their descendants. And if you want to include animals and plants and trees in that, that we are their descendants, yeah, go ahead and try that one on. <laughs> anyway, that gives you some ideas. <laughs> All right, great. And that's actually a perfect segue into the next question here uh, from Margaret, who says, uh, she's talking about getting messages. I work with my oracle cards every day, and I've been constantly getting messages to learn more about my lineage and work with my ancestors. But does this mean doing research on genealogy, or is this something I should learn about during meditation? Well, a little both, Margaret. Um, uh, th there's a wonderful site called an Ancestry.com. I actually signed up for it, and I found out a few things about my ancestors, and then it got to be uh, very time-consuming, you know, to go greater and greater in depth. And I'll, I'll pick it up someday later, but I've got you know, a few things I'm juggling right now. So I want to find out more. But Ancestry.com is a great way to start to link in. They've got a database that's just phenomenal. You know, they send questions like, do you know a David farmer, you know, who lives in Chicago or something like that? And then I respond accordingly. And if so, then they connect me with David's associations, etc. cetera. So um, I think, you, Margaret, you can do both. You know, let's do it, um, you could say, I guess, the linear way which is to uh, use a group um, like Ancestry.com. And I think there's probably one or two others like that, but I have the experience with Ancestry.com and I really like their, what they ha have to offer. And the other is, yeah, meditate. You know, uh, call in the ancestors, do the calling song. And if you want to get real specific, you could call in the grandmothers. You know, as a woman, you can call in the grandmothers. Grandmothers, grandmothers, we are calling, come, come, like I did at the beginning. Uh, and men, you can call in the grandfathers. You know, sometimes when I've done men's groups, we'll, we'll change it from ancestors to grandfathers. And um, there have been uh, times when I step back from the circle and the women are in the circle and they call in the grandmothers. And some of my trainings that, that where it's been... Uh, primarily women, well, all women except for myself, then uh, I, they've called in the grandmothers. So yeah, the, and I think that what I'm getting, Margaret, is that you are re already making contact. You know, it's, it's kind of funny because, uh, again, it's a given 
um, that the ancestors are a daily part of life. They, they are there with us. Well, I won't say us, but they're there with the people in these various, um, particularly indigenous or older cultures. Um, there was a, a friend of mine on a short story, Gretchen's her name, dear Gretchen, my sister. And uh, she's a shamanic practitioner. And years ago, she was called to work with an African healer, shaman, different word in that culture, uh, Sangoma. Uh, he came to the United States and she did a reading with him and got very interested. And one of the first things he did after just a few minutes sitting with her, she got very sad. And he said, I feel sad. And Gretchen went, why? He says, because you've lost your ancestors. I think that's a big statement there. You've lost your ancestors. Well, his name is P.H. Mokshala, if I'm saying that correctly. And I want to say to P.H., uh, who's in the afterlife now, is an ancestor, that uh, we're finding him. Uh, and <laughs> I would say the reverse, too. They're finding us. So all of these different ways, some of the questions that you guys have, I think are great because it implies you do have a curiosity, and that curiosity is what's going to lead you to develop these healthy relationships. I mean, I've got a story. I've, I've done so much healing with my mother, for instance. Um, I don't know if I want to take the time to share the story. It's, I, I want to hear more of the questions, but um, I, I'll tell the short version of it. Uh, I got a reading from a medium one time unexpectedly. A friend and I had gone to visit her uh, brother and sister-in-law and the sister-in-law, uh, she claimed to be a psychic medium, but she didn't do much of it because she said her mama and her grandma um, were, they messed with the dark forces, whatever that meant. Well, me being who I am, I said, well, I'd love to have a reading if you're willing. And sure enough, she gave me a reading. She took me to the depths of the pain that I felt around my mother. And um, basically that uh, I was a weird kid. <laughs> We have any others out there like that? Anyway, I was a weird kid, uh, very shy, very kind of quiet. I watched a lot in this craziness in the family. And um, she never got, she never knew me who I really was. You know, she did, she couldn't, it was not her fault. She just couldn't. So after this oh, intense session with this psychic medium, my friend and I, we were gonna go camping. So we went out outside, um, half hour outside of Portland out in the woods. And I started writing and, you know, tears are coming down my eyes, you know, as I'm thinking of some of that deeper you know, embedded kind of pain uh, in relationship with my mother. She came to me as I'm writing. I heard her voice as distinctly as if she were sitting right next to me. And she says, oh, Stephen, now I see who you are. She saw me. She got me. I just, <laughs> you know, I was, I just was in the depths of sobbing, kind of a happy, sad that she saw me, and without even using the word forgiveness, there was a tremendous amount of forgiveness that went, I believe, both ways, but certainly with my mother. Anyway, I didn't mean to. I, well, I did, I wasn't going to tell that story, but it was a powerful, it's a powerful telling about how the ancestors can come to us unexpectedly, even. And, and really teach us and show us and give us an opportunity for that, um, that kind of forgiveness that uh, clears things up, not only for the living, but for those in the afterlife so they can continue on their spiritual evolution. It's good stuff. And thanks for the question. Yeah, that was really a beautiful illustration of what exactly ancestral healing is for those who are just trying to figure out what exactly does that mean. You really did uh, encapsulate it in that story. So thank you for sharing that. Um, looking at the clock here, we have time for a few more questions. But before I uh, pass those on to you, I do want to give a few details about the course because people are asking about that, too. Uh, once again, it's called The Five Ancestral Realms. And in case you haven't noticed, this is going to be truly life-changing. Uh, it'll be a seven-week journey under Stephen's expert guidance where you'll explore the four channels of spiritual perception and hone them to explore the five ancestral realms that he was talking about earlier. Uh, the seven-week course takes place on Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific, 
starting Tuesday, October 29th. And if you can't join us for the live sessions, that's fine. You won't miss the teachings uh, because we record everything. You'll receive audio and video recordings, transcripts, and all course handouts on your course homepage. And also the Shift Network offers a no-risk money-back guarantee on all of our courses, giving you a full two weeks until November 12th in this case to make sure that you absolutely love it. And as an added option, all participants are welcome to connect in a private Facebook community group so you can connect with one another between classes and then for a year after it ends. Also, everyone who registers receives the Five Ancestral Realms bonus collection. First, you'll receive a guided audio meditation from Dr. Stephen Farmer entitled 4x4 Breathing Meditation. And next, you'll get a drumming track from Stephen, which you can use for self-directed journeying. And you'll also receive an audio teaching from Stephen entitled Four Channels of Spiritual Perception. And then you'll get a video teaching from Dr. Stephen Farmer called Healing Our Relationship with the Natural World. And plus, you'll receive another guided meditation journey from Stephen. And this one is entitled Receiving a Message from an Animal Spirit Guide. You'll also get a short article by Dr. Stephen Farmer called What is a Power Animal? And when you register by Midnight Pacific on Thursday, October 24th, you receive this extra gift, and that is a guided audio meditation from Stephen entitled Meditation to Clear Soul Body. So before we get back into uh, questions, Stephen, what are you most looking forward to sharing in your upcoming course? Well, I, I must share one thing, uh, and it's a card of a painting. Let's see if I can hold it up correctly here. Uh, a friend of mine who's uh, Australian Aboriginal uh, did for me, and you notice the serpent that's there in the hands. The serpent is the original ancestor. There we go with what I call prehistoric ancestors. And the original ancestor and the hands represent the human uh, descendants of the rainbow serpent. I just thought I picked that up and I thought that would be interesting to show. What am I most excited about, Lisa? I'm just, uh, I don't know if you can tell those of you who are listening, but just I have a passion for my work and I, I feel very grateful and very blessed to be able to do this. And um, it's really more invitation than anything else. You know, hey, this is what I'm on to. You know, let me share this with you. And if it, if it clicks for you, great. You know, the whole thing about spirit animals and power animals and how those are ancestral spirit beings and ancestral spirit guides. I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited, I think in general, Lisa, that that this typology that uh, I've described of the five different uh, types of ancestors, it goes so far back in our history that we begin to, when we work with this, we begin to appreciate our connection to everything including the cosmos, but especially our connection to all beings on this earth, that we really truly are related. You know, it's not just a philosophy or a concept. As I say that, I can feel it in my body. I just get really excited about that because we can talk about, well, we're all one. Well, it's nice as a philosophy, but we begin working with these, the ancestors on these various um, and, and these various types of ancestors, you realize, wow, we really are connected. In fact, as humans, 99.99% .99 of our genetic code is exactly the same. I always find that fascinating. And the other thing is that if you go back 20 generations, you have over a million ancestors. You go back 30, you got over a trillion. And beyond that, you can do the math because I don't even want to go there. <laughs> In fact, beyond that, we start looking at, oh, there are other kinds of ancestors, the prehistoric ancestors. You know, this monkey body that we're in, we're related to the apes. <laughs> I just, it just blows me away. As you can tell, I, I get lost for words to describe my excitement about that. So I think uh, not only that, but the opportunity to, for guidance. You know, we're, we're in a massive time of change. <laughs> Needless to say, you know, and the planet is changing, we're changing. Consciousness, you know, is being uprooted and turned over and we're being exposed to, you know, these different elements like ancestors and different ways of receiving guidance. You know, go out and talk to Ancestor Tree. Go out and just talk to Ancestor Tree tomorrow and say, my ancestor, thank you. What's the message you have for me? And then pay attention to what you see, hear, feel. 
and maybe things will happen like the tree starts waving in the breeze and then you hear something in your mind. I'd say, be a good scientist and experiment with this. So that's kind of a long answer, Lisa, but that's what I get excited about. Just first of all, the opportunity to teach this information. And second is that it truly is information that can help us on along on our soul's path. That's exciting. And people have said this, the feedback I get about this information and healing ancestral karma is just phenomenal. Absolutely. I'm in total agreement there. Uh, let's go to a question here from uh, Rolin, who says, why is it that this Samhain season, Halloween, for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, why is it that this season, the veil thinning seems so powerful? Is there a difference in the energetic work of the ancestors here? Well, again, I think, yeah, great question. And I, I'm glad you brought that up about Samhain, because that's the high holy days for the Celts was Samhain. And that is, as uh, you said in your question, or stated in your question, that's when the veil between uh, this world and the other world is the thinnest. And I love the uh, allegory too about Samhain, S-A-M-H-A-I-N, by the way, if you wanna look it up or explore it a little bit more. And that's that uh, what it was believed is that we honor the ancestors at that time of the year, right about um, one of the darkest times of the year, if not the darkest, uh, October 31st. And also it's been, uh, Day of the Dead, uh, El Dio de los Muertos, if I'm saying that correctly, also interestingly takes place at about that time. And also in Catholicism, it's All Saints Day, All Souls Day, right about that same time. Anyway, back to Samhain. Um, the, the deal <laughs> with Samhain is that you are, uh, especially if you have this in your heritage, but you can do this even if you don't, is that you set aside an altar specifically for the ancestors. And uh, I wouldn't do this, but you know, you place a candle on the altar. They say you're supposed to let it burn, but just even for the evening, let it burn. And then you put like uh, photos and artifacts of your mother, your father, your grandparents, your great grandparents, you know, anything you can. And also put some treats out there. You know, what was uh, a friend of mine who's Hispanic? She said, I would always leave tortillas out there for my abuela, my grandmother because she loved, she can't eat them, but she can smell them, you know, and when she comes to visit. So similar to Samhain, like I said. So you leave treats out on the altar so that they won't ingest them because they're not in physical body, but they'll be, ah, thank you, thank you. You know, you set treats out here. And it's been said that if you forget or you don't set the altar up and set treats out, that the ancestral spirits will trick you, not harm you, but trick you. You hear where we're going with that? Trick or treat. And that's where that's the basis for Halloween. And the word itself is All Hallows Evening. All Holy Evening. Holy Evening. And again, it's considered in Celtic lore to be the holiest of holies. That is the holiest evening when the ancestors come. Now, uh, the question, though, is like the energy, you know, you know, is it stronger? Is it more powerful? I think so. You know, my experience is that's what we're talking about here is how the ancestors are going, Psst, hey, wake up, we're here. You know, they're doing that in various ways. Like uh, somebody mentioned coming, uh, a, a relative, a deceased loved one coming to her in a dream, you know, things like that, where we're starting to wake up to this notion of ancestors. So even though P.H. Mishala said, uh, uh, sad, you know, and this is... 17 years ago, I think, with what Gretchen told me, even though he felt it was sad that we lost our ancestors, I got the good news. We're finding them again. And as importantly, they're finding us so that we can collaborate here so that we can pass this along, this healing and this guidance and this connection to this vast wealth of guidance from the ancestors to our children and our children's children as they evolve and as they adapt to the circumstances of the planet over the next several decades, the next several centuries. That, um, I think I probably said way too much, but in answer to your question, yeah, I think it's a real powerful time. I encourage every one of the, you who's listening to this, set up an ancestral altar right around Halloween. And again, you can build it, just put a few things. You don't need a great big altar, even just a few things, photos, etc. 
and maybe, oh, they like grapes, so let's put some grapes there. Or like uh, uh, my friend said, you know, put some tortillas there. And, um, and then the next morning, you know, thank the ancestors for visiting, and who knows? You may find that somebody um, had a nibble or two from the grapes, and no one else was around except the ancestors. <laughs> so a great time of the year to have this whole course and a great time of the year to really bring that into conscious awareness even more so. And I thank you all for doing that too. All right, I've got, I've got a little glass of port on mine. They seem to like that. <laughs> oh yeah, the smell and the mm, yum yum. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you, Lisa. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we are so close to being out of time, but I do want to squeeze in one last question because, again, several people are asking, what if I don't know anything about my ancestors? What if I'm an orphan, illegitimate, uh, broken lineages? What if I don't know who these people are? Can I still do this work? Absolutely. Um, there, I did uh, the very first class I did a few years uh, after it was even before the book came out, Healing Ancestral Karma. Um, I had a group of a small group, about 15, 16 people, and they told me, I mean, directly, I heard it. They said, there's going to be someone in your group that doesn't know her biological parents. Don't worry about it. It's going to work anyway. It being some of the processes and the, the, the uh, experiences that we did in the class, which we'll be doing in the course, by the way. And uh, sure enough, guess what happened? I opened the group, talked a little bit about ancestors and ancestral karma uh, and uh, how to heal, how we're going to be work with healing it. And somebody stood up, and uh, not stood up, but raised their hand at the back of the circle, because I like that size group I like to teach in circles. And she said, what if you don't know your parents or who they were? You know, you were adopted and you don't know your biological parents. I said, Funny you should ask me that, because <laughs> the ancestors told me, don't worry about it. So we did some of these processes, and um, which, again, you, we're going to do this some of these in the course. And she came up to me after class, and she just looked at me and says, you know what? They were right. It worked really, really well. So they, that person may not have a visual memory of, let's say, the mo their mother or their father, but they can still access them because they are vibrationally and biologically connected to them. So in doing that healing, let's say if you want to do some healing or information about your, let's say your mother, biological mother, again, go back to maybe automatic writing. Mother, I don't know who you are exactly, but I do know that I am of your blood. And can you please give me some kind of a message or information about yourself? Or you can simply meditate and ask, ask in that same way without doing the writing. So there you go. There's a good question. I'm glad that I'm glad that someone asked that, Lisa. So thank you for asking the question, and I want you to be um, confident that you'll be able to access your biological lineage. Right. Wow. So many more questions. I guess everyone's going to have to sign up for the course if they want them answered. Uh, this has been just a wonderful hour, and it's going to be a wonderful course. I want to thank all of our viewers for being with us today and for all of your fantastic questions. Once again, The Five Ancestral Realms starts Tuesday, October 29th. And again, you can visit AncestralRealmsCourse.com to learn more and to register. So, Stephen, before we cut you loose, do you have any final words for our viewers? Yeah, uh, you know, love, and this thing about love, you know, it's been stated again and again and again, but I notice a lot of times very glibly saying to people, you know, my people that are in my circle, love you, love you. And I'm going to uh, invite everyone to draw that out a little bit, you know, look them in the eyes and say, I love you. I love you, not love you. It's okay to say love you, by the way. I'm not making it wrong. It's just I want to, I think it's another step closer to really speaking from the heart to pause and look somebody in the eyes like that. You know, because these days, you know, or any day really, you know, you never know. Uh, your children, your parents, your grandparents, your uncles, your aunts, you know, all these people that are part of your family, uh, the family that ha that's not part of your blood family. Uh, it really is true, not just uh, in words, but in deed, too, is to really love as much as you can and forgive as much as you can. That would be my final message. 
All right. Beautifully put. Thank you again, Dr. Stephen Farmer. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Lisa. You're a great host, too. Thank you. And thank you all for your questions and for listening in. And again, I invite you to join us for the course. I, I know you will have no regrets and it will just amplify your spiritual uh, family, if you will, uh, greatly by joining us. So hope you do. Absolutely. And once again, I would like to thank everyone who joined us today. On behalf of all of us at the Shift Network, I wish you well and look forward to having you on this course or perhaps another one in the future. Have a great night, everyone.